So we've got Southwest from Jonesboro. We're at the college side, church in Cookville. And then we have Murray Hills from Columbia, just south of you. Yeah, I just saw Russ. Great to see him. Well, thanks for Hey, guys, here. great to see you. Sorry I was running late. I had a very interesting pastoral situation drop in my office right before as I was logging on. And uh, so you guys know how that goes. I was trying to manage that and log on at the same time, and it wasn't very easy. So. Well, we've had Darren Shesky here from uh, Indianapolis. Uh, and Darren uh, planted uh, the Heartlands Church in 2000, and he's been uh, just helping us think through what their process was and processes of, of catalyzing for growth, and, and our focus has been on igniting your church growth in you. And this is, hello. This is Darren. Hey. And this is hey, man. Good to meet you. Darren is actually going nice to meet, to meet, a, meet a planter in the gulch. Right now. Here in Nashville? Yes. Yes. Dude, we need to connect. All right. Well, Stan can uh, get you my email. His name's Preston Sharp, and it's, uh, he's a good young guy, so you can go connect with him. Man, that's amazing. We, so you're sending a planter into the gulch? Yes, that's right. Oh, man, we'd love to connect with him. That'd be awesome. All right. I'll make sure we get connected. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Greg. Thank you so much. Okay, and send me your PowerPoints and we'll get it up to you. Yeah. Well, what we like to do is have a, uh, have a case study. And so Dave has said he'll be the case study here. So I'd like to start by letting Dave kind of give us an orientation to ethos. Uh, how old, what the worship, how many worship experiences, venues, uh, growth plan, vision. Just kind of get us oriented, Dave. Yeah, so we planted Ethos about five and a half years ago in my living room, uh, 10 or 12 of my friends. We're about five and a half years old. We currently meet in two locations. Uh, within those two locations, we have three different venues. And across those locations and venues, currently we have seven Sunday worship gatherings. Um, in the summer, you know, we've been running around 25, 2600 in weekend attendance. It's about... 80% of our church is under the age of 30, just to kind of give you a, a framework. Um, uh, highly single, a little more male than female, just kind of gives you a, a picture there. We've got, uh, we just finished training 200 new house church leaders, which I'm really excited about, that will be scattered out across 15 different regions in Nashville, Middle Tennessee. And then we have a couple of international church plants and church planters that we're working with, um, as well as right now we have 12 folks that we're training to plant churches um, in the room right next to me. They're actually doing that as we speak. We do that every Tuesday. And uh, we are in the process of launching a couple new campuses here in the city as well. So that's kind of the, the snapshot of where we're at. So I hope you can hear If you can't hear me, just let me know. What were some as okay. Ethos is approaching its sixth birthday right now, right? Yes, uh, end of October will be our sixth, sixth birthday. So you've gone from meeting in your, your home to multiple sites, multiple venues, multiple thousands of people. So what are, uh -huh. some, what are some of the, uh, and kind of think through that, what are some of the growth stages that you went through and some of the challenges that came with each of those stages? Yeah, so, you know, so for us, our, our, biggest, our biggest growth barrier has always been the growth barrier that we're currently facing, if that makes any sense. Does that make sense? You guys can kind of shake your head. I don't know. I can barely see you. But um, whatever we're currently facing always feels like our biggest um, growth challenge. And so um, when my living room filled up, trying to figure out what to do next felt like a big hurdle. There were several kind of growth barriers in the next few seasons. I'd say that the first one that we really hit, that we really felt, was when we were around 400 people. Um, we needed to go to multiple services. We we're trying to figure out if we had the leaders and the systems to do it. Uh, I'd say the next growth barrier was when we hit about 1,000 and uh, working with developing new leaders to prepare for a second location and 
what that was going to look like and how we we're going to do that. And then I'd say right now we're, we're kind of in another one. We've, we've got a lot of eager people and we're trying to kind of catch up in regards to developing our top tier of leadership. You know, folks that can carry the highest level of responsibility into new parts of the city. And so uh, we've been kind of rapid fire trying to train our highest level of leaders so we can deploy a little more quickly. And so uh, the, the barrier that we're kind of hitting right now is we have a lot of eager people who are waiting on some of the higher level leadership within them to mature. And so we've got several communities, pockets of community around the city where if we just had the right leader, we could really do something cool. So we're kind of waiting on that leader um, to develop. So when you look back at those, uh, at those growth challenge points, are there some decisions that come out to you where you think, man, if we hadn't made that decision, we wouldn't be where we are today? Yeah, I think for us, there's always this illusion that it's, you know, one day we'll feel ready to multiply. And I think the longer we've done this, we just realize multiplication never feels convenient. Um, it's the same thing, you know, when you're having kids, you know, you don't ever wake up and go, we are perfectly ready to have kids, you know, at least my wife and I didn't. Um, we just came to a point where the idea of having kids was less scary than it used to be. And then all of a sudden, you know, some things happened. We had kids. I won't go into that. But it's sort of the same thing, I think, in, in, in multiplying churches. You know, there's this, this fear that you have to get through. And I think for us, at every stage of the game, there's this point of going, okay, we're not going to feel ready to do it. Are we ready enough? And... Um, we've just tried to constantly posture ourselves as people who are ready enough. <laughs> and maybe that's really terrible advice, but, um, you know, as we, as we kind of work through it. And so we have always been the type of church that shoots the bullet and then tries to aim it after we've shot it. And uh, we've always, um, you know, launched things before we were ready and, and then tried to come back around on the back end and, um, keep getting them better, and that's just sort of in our DNA, and and that's been key for us. We didn't have a single person on staff until our church was two and a half years old, including myself. I was bivocational, and so we were a church of 600 meeting in multiple services, and it was all done by volunteers, which is messy, as you can imagine, but it also kind of created this culture of okay, we're not quite ready, but we believe God's doing something, let's do it, and that's part of the faith process for us. And so um, I think a lot of times just kind of having the courage to step out has been the key decision. You know, when we planted our second campus, we look back on that timeline, and the timeline was insane. We made the decision, announced it to the church, and launched it within four weeks. It was a four-week window that all of that process happened. And I'm not saying I recommend that, but... Um, we look back and go, man, we would have missed out on so much of what God was doing had we not taken that step when he opened the door for us. So, I don't know, does that kind of answer your question, Stan? I think so. Uh, what, what other key decision points do you, you look at where, I don't know, maybe, they, maybe you felt like they were a bit crisis points or maybe they were surprise points? But just kind of, as you look back, where there's some other points where you just said, man, we're, well, without that, we, it just wouldn't have gone the way it's gone. Yeah, you know, in the early days when we started multiplying, we were trying to decide, do we want to be a mega church or do we want to be a movement? And we're not opposed to, to either of those things, but we just kind of decided we wanted, we wanted to be a movement. And to be a movement, you know, we needed to really release people in such a way that our church could be built around the gifts of many people and not just gathered around the gifts of a few people. And that was kind of a, that was a, a big deciding moment for us. And so we decided we need to really start training and releasing people um, to do some things so that we can one day really multiply. And so a few years ago, we really started um, not just training lay leaders, but really giving lay leaders big areas of responsibility within the church and allowing them to fail and to innovate and to try some things. And, and what it's really produced is um, 
the ability to multiply because it's not all based upon our staff. Um, and so that was, a, that was a big decision point for us, you know, um, how can we really trust God to use, you know, just ordinary people to do some extraordinary things. And so um, we started handing off big, big chunks of um, ministry responsibility to, you know, to, to lay people. And a lot of them were really young, you know, um, we handed, we handed our first campus off to, uh, at the time he was 23 years old, he was selling insurance and never worked in ministry a day in his life. And, you know, now he's working with a campus of, you know, almost a thousand people and God's used him to do incredible things. We've been teaching him to preach. He's been, um, you know, but we kind of threw this huge thing in his lap and, and uh, let him make some mistakes and we coached him. And, but, but that decision to trust people um, and to trust that God was going to do something with people um, really started opening up the door or um, for us to multiply in a lot of areas. And so in our house churches, in our volunteer teams, in our campuses, it just kind of, that, that idea spread across the board. Um, and you, you mentioned that there's a theme that's coming through here. There's kind of two of them. One of them is leadership, and the other one is teams. Can you walk us through some of your major teams, your, the, the teams that you just really lean in and how, how do you organize and develop those teams and the leaders who run those teams? Yeah, so for us, we, we really believe in leadership, but we especially believe in leadership that's happening in the context of community. And so we, we really do everything in teams. You know, one of the analogies that we use a lot is a football team is one team, but it's made, made up of a bunch of special teams within it, you know, offense, defense, special teams, all those things. And we really see ourselves as a collection of teams working in the city for the good of the city, for the glory of God. And so, you know, with, within the context, if I was going to show you our organizational chart, it doesn't look like a pyramid. It looks more like a, a bunch of circles that go out as if you threw a rock in the pond and the ripples go out. Does that make sense? And so um, I always tell our teams and our leaders of our teams that we're not leading down. So it's not you as a leader leading down to your team. You as a leader, you're in the middle with Christ leading out. Does that a, a image make sense to you at all? And so our, the way that we're structured is we are standing among our people and with our people in the presence of Christ and we're leading them out in the further expressions of God's kingdom sort of like a rock that's being splashed in a pond and moving out and so if you're going to look at our teams you know in the middle of our circle uh, is Jesus and then around Jesus is we have a governance team uh, who really helps us with some kind of big key issues that would be like your elder board probably uh, and then we have a leadership team that drives vision decisions and then we have a lead staff, and so kind of around Jesus, in that innermost part of the circle, I have three key teams that I lead kind of as a liaison, and then around them is a staff, and around our staff are what we call our super regional leaders. These are lay leaders that pastor groups of house church leaders, and so we have 200 house church leaders. Uh, each house church leader has a regional leader. Each regional leader has a super regional leader. And so um, our super regional leaders oversee six to eight regional leaders who oversee 10 to 12 house church leaders. And so within each little cluster, you know, we'll have two to 300 people. And so we have these lay leaders who are essentially stewarding and shepherding and leading pockets of 300 people within our church. And, uh, but they're not over them leading down there, among them leading out. And so their job is to pull them into the presence of Christ and push them out for the good of the city. And so uh, all of the work and all of the, the mission and the leadership that we do kind of flows out of that idea that we're pressing into the Lord and we're moving out together. And uh, we think that the way forward in our context is going to be to keep handing off the ministry, to keep making it simple and breaking it up and sending it out. Um, we think that's the way, you know, there's 800,000 people in our city uh, not connected with the community of faith, and we would have to plant 400 churches that look just like ethos to reach them, and that's kind of, it's virtually impossible to do it that way, and so the thing that we've been putting before our leaders is 
in the next 10 years, can we release 6,000 liters to reach our city? That's kind of our goal. Um, can we release 6,000 new liters into our city to plant big churches and small churches and, I mean, just all over the board. And so that's kind of how we've structured our teams. Uh, one of the things that I tell everybody on our team is um, your job is you're constantly learning from someone and you're replacing yourself by training someone. And so that's kind of our key to, key to working. There's someone in front of you and there's someone behind you. And uh, no matter where you are in our team structure, that's always true. So. You, you talked through that scenario like, uh, I mean, like that was probably, I mean, now you really see it, but I would think two years ago, three years ago, it wasn't quite that clear. It's kind of that chicken and the egg. Do you develop all your understandings and systems and then you deploy, or do you deploy and let your system begin to emerge out of that? How, how do you approach that balance of taking action and then figuring out what the result or making the plan and then taking the action? And that's the age old question in church leadership, right? Like, you know, and I don't know if I have a a great answer for it. One of the things that we've discerned is that there are certain areas of our leadership structure that have come to us very intuitively that we've done from day one. Um, and you know, I, I bet all of you have the same aspects of your ministry that are just very intuitive. So I don't know why this is true, but for whatever reason, I've always been able to see systems and to release leaders. Um, it's always just kind of come natural to me um, as an entrepreneur in a ministry. It's been kind of an easy thing. There's been other areas of our leadership structure that haven't been as intuitive that we've had to work towards and train towards. And so that's kind of the chicken and the egg for us. The stuff that we've done intuitively, we go, how do we keep reproducing that, but do it a little more systematically so others can do it? And then the areas that we've been weak in, um, going, okay, how do we start learning and getting stronger in there so we don't keep reproducing an area of weakness over and over and over? Um, and so, you know, to give you an example, in my context, um, if you were looking at Ephesians 4, our church um, is very high on the apostolic and the evangelistic and the teaching gifts. I'm talking about our people, not our leadership, even just our church as a whole. But we've been very weak in regards to shepherding. And so, you know, the stuff that we've done intuitively has been the apostolic, evangelistic, and teaching work. But the stuff that we've had to learn how to do and prepare and train for and work hard on has been shepherding work. So that as we keep doing apostolic stuff into the city, we don't keep raising up groups of half-baked, half-mature followers of Jesus. So um, that's, that's kind of how we work through that tension. The stuff we do well, let's get better at naming it so others can do it well. And the stuff that we don't do well, let's learn how to do it so we don't keep reproducing a broken system. Oh, great. So you mentioned that, uh, that uh, evangelism gift, and we've been talking about how, you know, how you ignite that, how you, you develop a, a culture of invitation and of sharing Jesus. I kind of think back through ethos, and what were, were there a key moment or two where you just feel like that was a moment when you really sunk that DNA because it if it was just really natural, I think we would see more of it, but it seems to be so rare in churches that that evangelistic, invitational, sharing Jesus thrust is uh, probably not something that just happens, but that is a planned event. How, how do you see, what were those, some moments where you see that was really uh, driven into the DNA of ethos so that now it is a natural part of who ethos is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's probably a lot of those moments. I think one of the biggest ones for us has been prayer. And I know that sounds like the generic church answer, but when we planted Ethos, I, I was not a, a... Can you guys still see me? My computer just turned off. Can you see me? Okay. Came back on. Um, when we planted Ethos, I was not a praying person. I thought I was. I was a person who would pray sometimes, but I wasn't a prayer, if, if that makes any sense at all. And, kind of in this journey, God has turned me into a, a, a praying man. And one of the things a few years ago that really 
snapped in us as we asked our church for a season, do you believe that you can pray people into the kingdom of God? And intellectually, we're all like, yes, we do. But in reality, none of us believed that. And so we really kind of went on this journey uh, going, what if we can pray people into the kingdom of God? What if, and we now, we kind of came up with this really crude analogy um, that we use internally. And um, so hopefully you know my heart, and I don't mean this to be shocking or anything, but we've always kind of internally said that prayer is to evangelism what sex is to childbirth. Or prayer is to church planting what sex is to childbirth. And, uh, you know, in childbirth, you can paint the nursery, you can name the kid, you can put together the crib. But if there's no conception, there will never be a baby there. And in church planting or ministry, we can create the systems, we can come up with the strategy, we can start the church. But if there's never been an igniting force from heaven in the hearts of your people, there will be no new birth. There, there will be no evangelistic work. And so we started looking, the thing that spurred this in us, we were looking at the great revivals that you see throughout human history and in the scriptures, and every one of them are ignited by people who are praying. And we thought, this is, there's got to be something to this. And so um, we started praying, and it's really... Um, in that season, we did some real tangible things. We, we got these trash cans. We had everybody in our church write the name of someone on a card that they knew who didn't know the Lord and to put it in that trash can. And we started praying over those trash cans at all of our services. And then we started a prayer gathering where we just prayed over those trash cans. And what was amazing was how many of those people came to the Lord that year that were on those cards. And... We started sharing that, and people were like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I never even, you know, just, just things started happening as, as we started praying. And what we found was that that moment of prayer was not just about us getting God to do what we wanted him to do in the lives of those people, but it was really more about God getting into us, uh, about God um, getting us to see and to do um, what he wanted us to be a part of. And we found that. We had always kind of viewed prayer as this one-way street, practically. We didn't think that intellectually, but practically, we just kind of thought it was us to God. And in that season of our church, we started seeing it was God to us as well. And he was putting within us um, a heart that would be ready for evangelistic work. And um, he helped us become a church that was more receptive towards, you know, the work that Jesus, the chief evangelist, was doing. And so, you know, I love that scene in Acts 2 where it says that, it was the Lord who was adding to their number daily, those who were being saved. And so we started just praying, going, okay, God, could you make us the type of church where you would feel comfortable sending your lost sheep to? And so we're going, okay, if Jesus is not only the chief shepherd of our church, but he's the chief evangelist in our city, Jesus, as our chief shepherd, would you make us the type of place where you could also be our chief evangelist? And prayer just kind of became that moment where something started happening, and and I would say every good evangelistic thing that came out of that over the last couple of years started in that prayer um, moment. And so we started doing grow classes where we, you know, teach people how to share their faith more practically. And we started trying to train people how to use service opportunities in the city as a point of relational evangelism. Uh, we've tried to create cultures within our Sunday gatherings and in our house churches that are um, friendly and um, open to non-believers. But I'd say the real work of evangelism has been prayer for us. And so, I don't know, did, is that helpful? Does it make any sense? Okay, just got one more question, and then we're going to open up for a Q&A. You've got, you've seen God bring about a, a healthy, dynamic, kingdom-growing church. And I'd like you to think of kind of summing up ethos for us, but rather than giving us narrative, are there, is there a story or two of people that for you in your heart you say, that's ethos, their life, that's our story? Could you share that, those one or two stories with us? Man, that's, that's a great story. That's a great question. I'll, I'll just give you a couple that just come to my heart right off the bat. I think about 
uh, one of our guys who, when he was 18 or 17 years old, his parents dropped him off at a homeless shelter here in town, uh, essentially because they just didn't want to be parents anymore, which just blows my mind. And uh, they drove back to Virginia where they were from and left him there. Um, our church met him at a, um, they met him at this service thing that we do a few times a year because the homeless shelter is right across the street from us. We'll go over and serve. And, and we meet this guy, and the first thing he said to us was, um, I don't know how God can love me if my own parents don't love me. And one of our volunteers just kind of made this stupid statement. They said, of course your parents love you. What are you talking about? And he said, no, my parents hate me. They literally dropped me off last weekend at this homeless shelter because they don't want to be my parents anymore. And we were like, what in the world is that about? And um, he starts kind of hanging around and being a part of what we're doing. People start reaching out to him, loving him, just inviting him into life. He becomes a follower of Jesus. I'm doing a wedding next week. The people that discipled him, they put him in the wedding as a ring bearer. I mean, he's this grown man. You know, they just love him. He's so amazing. Um, but he wants to train to be a pastor. He's leading a house church for us this fall. Um, we're training him and going, man, God is going to use you. You know, like this is, God is going to do something amazing. And he's become this great evangelist for us. And, and you know, when I look at him, I go, I don't just want him to feel loved and accepted. I want him to see himself as God sees him. And that is very useful and loved in the kingdom of God. So not only is he loved by God, but he's useful in the kingdom of God. And so, you know, we want him to find his place. And, you know, I want him leading. And I go, one day he'll be an elder somewhere. And he's going to be a great dad and a great husband. And uh, I look at guys like him and I go, that's why we do what we do. Uh, so people can go on this great journey of faith. And, you know, I can tell you some other stories, but he's the one that just popped to my mind. He texted me a few minutes ago, and so I just thought, kind of thought of him. But this is amazing dude, so. Yeah, one, one more right. story that, that kind of fits in that same realm. What, one more story? Um, yeah, so I think about a girl named Betsy who's in our church, 19 years old. And if some of you know me, you've heard me tell the story a lot. It's been one of the most shaping stories to me over the years. She had this vision, you know, that God was asking her to go start a strip club ministry. And she wanted to take a group of women down to work in strip clubs and, uh, in Nashville. And so it started a few years ago with this 19-year-old girl in one strip club. Taking this one group has kind of spread into this thing where she's now got groups of women that lead house churches in every strip club in Nashville. She started the same ministry, she started groups in Memphis and in Boston and in Huntsville. And, and I, I look at her, and every time I see her, I'm like, you're our apostle to the underworld. I mean, you're the one that God has sent out to, to reach people that I, I'm not going to reach. In fact, my wife would leave me if I went to reach them in the way that she reaches them. <laughs> but she, she's just this amazing woman, and I look at her, and she doesn't want to go work in a church. Like, she doesn't want to do a church job. You know, she, she wants to be a writer. She's an English major. And I'm just, like, blown away by what happens when just regular people realize they're following a supernatural God. And if we can just get out of the way and not be scared of what's going to happen. Uh, I mean, I just some of the best stuff that's happened in our church over the last few years has come from the vision that God gave her and the courage that she had to do it. And for whatever reason, we just had the sense not to like, you know, like over manage it or shut it down or be scared of it. And uh, God has done incredible stuff. So uh, she actually just moved and she's handed it off to a team of women that she's trained. And, and uh, so I'm excited to see what God's going to do through her in a new part of the world. So that's great. Thank you. Let's, let's open it up for, what do you want to ask Dave here? He's got a, a wealth of, both of the experience and ideas for us. Yes, Dave, talk a little bit more about Sunday night prayer gathering on Sunday nights. Chris is asking about your Sunday night prayer gathering. Any I know he said that the prayer of the church dance, but what's that look like? How they continue to generate names? And how do they use that in the life? Yeah, Stan, if you can just repeat any questions, I can't hear anybody but you. I can barely hear you, Stan. Uh, 
Chris, uh, Chris was asking about your Sunday evening prayer gathering and how you sustained that and sustained praying for names for lost people. Maybe you can yeah. describe that process, that, that ongoing piece. Yeah, our, our Sundays, our prayer gathering, it's the most simple thing that we do as a church. Um, we don't set up anything. We don't have any chair set up. We, don't, we always tell people, if you want a chair, you've got to bring it with you. And we meet up in the, the top uh, floor of the bar slash music venue that we meet in. It's just this open bar. And we'll spend 10 minutes worshiping, just kind of setting our hearts on the character of God. We normally reflect on a passage together, and then we break up into groups, and we have a facilitator that just walks us through times of prayer. Um, and so um, typically our times of prayer kind of revolve around three areas. Um, we, we pray supernaturally for what God is trying to do in the heart of our church. That's kind of the first area. The second area is that we pray uh, for God's supernatural help and what he's trying to do um, between us and other believers, you know, like beyond ethos. And then the third piece that we always pray about is um, our relationship to lost people and what God's trying to do there. So just kind of those three areas, you know, up, in, and out. That's everything in our church. Love God, love people, awaken the movement. It's all based off of that. Our prayer gathering is based off of that. And and we just get in groups and, and pray. And and then we'll end, time, we'll end our prayer time by just thanking God through song together for what he did. And uh, sometimes we'll, we'll all pray out loud. Sometimes we'll get groups. Um, sometimes we'll take silence and times of silence and it's just a really fun energetic you know normally lasts about an hour and a half sometimes it goes longer um, never goes shorter <laughs> but that's kind of the way that it goes that's radical man praying for 90 minutes that's radical well what was funny and some of you will relate to this when we first started the prayer gathering we really filled the whole time up with a bunch of other stuff other than praying because we didn't think anybody could pray that long. And, and the longer we've been praying, the shorter everything else has gotten because people have loved praying so much. And, you know, our hope is that one day we'll be able to just get up there and say, hey, welcome to prayer gathering. We're going to start praying. <laughs> Go for it and, and just let it do its thing. But like anything, you kind of have to train people and open up those doors. And it's been really sweet. We've been doing that for... The, the ongoing prayer gathering has been going for exactly a year. That prayer movement that I talked about um, earlier started about two and a half years ago, and we did some special prayer events and days of prayer and fasting, but we didn't have an ongoing prayer rhythm. Hey, Dave. Uh, my name's Chip Pugh. Uh, I'm a campus minister here, and I came down, uh, visited y'all, uh, a few months ago, and it was obvious there's a heavy college uh, group, and I just wanted to hear more about how, what have, what have y'all done with area campuses to attract college students? Because it was obvious that it, that it was pretty heavy as far as the numbers go in that, in that regard. Yeah, our, our main strategy for reaching the campuses has been really empowering students at the highest level of leadership. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, we've tried to let students know from the day you step your foot on campus, we're ready to use you in the kingdom of God. And so we have a lot of our um, college students that start leading house churches for us when they're freshmen. And by the time they get out of college, they've led house churches for four years. They've led ministries into the cities, into the city, um, you know, we really try to pour gasoline on what on the fires that God is starting on campuses around the city, and that's been our primary strategy. So instead of just trying to get college students to come and feel comfortable and to feel like, hey, you're welcome here at church with us, we've kind of said, hey, you're the church. We're going to use you. If you want to be here, um, you're no longer in your parents' house, and uh, you cannot be a spiritual consumer here anymore. We're going to use you as a force in the kingdom. And our college students have come alive in that. And uh, as you can imagine, I mean, as a campus minister for five years before planting a church, uh, empowering college students uh, is fun, and it's also exhausting because they're going to make a lot of mistakes. Uh, and, but we all make mistakes, and so we've just found, um, let's help them make their mistakes quickly so they'll, they'll mature. 
And by the time they get out of college, they're going to be a force in the kingdom of God. Um, we, uh, are any of you guys familiar with Kid President? Have any of you heard of Kid President? Yeah. So, um, Kid President, they just made a TV show, and they're making it here in Nashville, and each week they were like highlighting different things, um, and the majority of the episodes were built around ministries that were started by our college students uh, that are still being led by college students that we don't manage, that we don't control, that we don't do, and it is incredible what happens when you raise the bar on the expectation for a student and just go, and we are we are ready. We have a place for you. And when you do that, we've really found students just kind of swarm to that. Can you list the uh, campuses that you have activity on that you have students at? Yeah. So our primary campuses: um, Belmont University, Lipscomb University, Vanderbilt, TSU, Fisk, Trevecca, um, Middle Tennessee State. University, MTSU, um, Watkins College of Art and Design, um, uh, who, am I, who am I forgetting? Um, oh, SAE, which is a um, music school here. So those are kind of our, uh, and Aquinas, it's a nursing school. So those are kind of like our big college influences. We have people from beyond that, but I'd say our big chunks, our big pockets come from those groups. The majority of our students come from the first four that I listed, Belmont, Vanderbilt, Trevecca, and Lipscomb. Hey, David, how do you guys do your uh, worship services on Sunday? You guys have a teaching team, and you do volunteer worship leaders, or staff, or how, how does that work? Yeah, so we've, we've got this teaching team. You know, everything that we do, we try to do in community. And so I've got a, a group, we call it our, our teaching and preaching meeting on Thursdays. We've got between 12 and 16 people that are all lay leaders that are in that meeting every week that help us develop the sermons. And as they're helping us develop sermons, we're really just trying to develop them. And then, you know, a few times a year we'll release that team to preach in our different services. Um, we've got a, a team right now of guys that preach across our different um, locations and services and um, some weeks, or most weeks, probably about 70% of the time, I'll do all of them, but that's going to officially change two weeks from now when we launch a new service at Marathon. It will become impossible for one person to do them all. And so starting two weeks from now, every week will be team teaching. Uh, every now and then we'll use video to supplement, but that's not our primary means of um, what we do. And then, so, you know, we probably use video once a month, at least in some of our services to give some of our guys a breather. And then we do, we have one full-time guy who leads all of our worship leaders. His primary job is to disciple other worship leaders. And so the majority of people that lead worship for us are lay leaders that are working under his teams. Uh, Jimmy Adcox is asking about your baptism Sundays and how, how, you, how you prepare and carry those out. How we, how we prepare those and how we carry those out? Yes. Yeah, so I don't know how much you're wanting logistically, but about four times a year we do a big baptism service and big baptism Sunday, and we have people get baptized almost every week of the year, but we'll have a special time where we just kind of call people to really consider it and to think about that next step in their journey. And two or three weeks leading up to baptism Sunday, we'll We'll have our church praying about it, and we'll um, ask people to really consider it and to think about if God's calling them to take that step. And if they're interested, they can fill out a card, and someone from our ministry team will meet with them leading up to that. And then at our services on Baptism Sunday, we just open it up to anybody that wants to be baptized. And one of the things that we've kind of found is that leading up to Baptism Sunday, we'll always have a few people that will reach out and say, hey, we're ready. And, and then we'll have way more people who will step up uh, spontaneously on that day and, and be baptized. And so that's kind of been one of those moments where we just cast the nets wide. And 
it's really, it's as much of a faith journey for our team as it is for the people who are being baptized because, you know, we have to get all these volunteers to show up early and set up horse troughs and we have to fill them up with buckets because we don't have a hose and, and we're folding clothes and towels and we have people ready to pray and respond if anyone comes. And then there's always that part in our heart that goes, what if nobody comes? Or what if we set the table, you know, what if we prepare for uh, 100 people to get baptized and we have, you know, all these volunteers and only one person comes? And, uh, or nobody comes. We've had a baptism Sunday where nobody was baptized, you know, before, back in the, the early days. And so um, it's just a faith journey where everyone involved is having to press in and go, you know, God, what we're really after is you and what you want. And, you know, our job's just to step in it, uh, into it. I kind of use the analogy with our teams. It's kind of like the Israelites when God says, when your feet hit the water, they'll part. And we have found that Baptism Sundays are kind of one of those moments where our feet have to hit the water as leaders, where we have to say, here's where we're going, here's what we're going to invite you to do, and let's just see what God does. And every time, He just blows us away. We're, we're getting ready to have another Baptism Sunday in a couple of weeks, and um, you know, hardly anybody has responded to say, we're going to be baptized. And, it used to kind of make us feel nervous, and we go, that's actually just the norm, at least in our culture uh, here at Ethos. I have a friend across town, they'll, they'll have baptism sign-ups, and they'll have like 100 people sign up. And I'm like, you dog, you know, that's, that's not a step of faith, that's just a big birthday party, you know, you're, and I'm just jealous, that's the only reason I make fun of them for it, um, is because I wish that's how it was here, but that's not been our experience, uh, but we, we have people come out of the woodwork every time, and it's just amazing. So if you've never done one of those, I just encourage you to go for it. Um, pray about it. Try it. Jimmy's asking what the service looks like. It, is, it, is it really different from your normal service? Or is it kind of the same service and then the baptism part put on the end of it? Or just kind of walk us through how it looks. Yeah, most of the time it's a really normal service. It's a time of worship and um, teaching, and then at the end of the teaching, that's our, our respond time, and so uh, our church takes communion as people are responding to come forward to be baptized, and then depending on how many people come up to be baptized in a service, kind of depends on what those baptisms look like, and so, you know, we've had times where two people come up in a service, and you know, we sit down as a church and we hear their story and we gather around them to pray and, and they come up out of the water and we sing over them. And, and then there's been times where we've had 50 people respond in a service to be baptized. And um, that looks very different. You know, we just start calling people up to help us do baptisms and they lead worship through it. And, and uh, we're hearing responses, you know. So it, how the actual baptism part really just kind of depends on what the uh, response is like. And so we try to prepare for everything and just be flexible. Um, there have been times, you know, because we have multiple services in a day where the baptisms from one service ran into the next service. And so um, there was, you know, last time we did a baptism service, we actually started the next service with baptisms from the service before. And at the end of those baptisms, I just went into a teaching on baptism. <laughs> which is a great setup, you know, and then we just went into response time again, and so just just trying to be flexible. Um, this upcoming baptism service we're having, we're doing it during the prayer gathering, and we'll do that once or twice a year because there's some people who are just terrified of walking up in front of five or 600 people, and so, you know, at our prayer service, we'll set up four or five baptistries around the room, and they can come with their family members and their neighbors and can gather around, and it's a little more intimate, and so... Um, we'll do that once or twice a year as well to kind of speak to different personalities and different audiences. Hey Dave, I know you, it's mostly a younger congregation, but what's happening with uh, children ministry, student ministry? With, with our uh, children's, children's ministry? Yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, because our church is so young, our kids' ministry is starting to boom, if you know what I mean. You put two and two together. Um, we, we've had at least 50 weddings every year for the last three years within our church. 
and um, th this year we're expecting about a hundred weddings and so um, with that comes a lot of children and so you know when my oldest son was born four years ago he was one of three children in the whole church and we were churching about 900 at the time um, now you know on any given Sunday we'll have 150 160 kids under the age of nine years old um, 90 percent of those kids are under the age of four so um, we have rapidly started expanding what we're doing with kids and so we have kids ministry at uh, all of our services at the cannery and we're just now launching kids ministry at our second campus um, and it's almost two years old it'll be two years old this fall and uh, we just kind of told them our kids ministry is you bringing a coloring book <laughs> bring a coloring book and cheerios that's our kids ministry and um, but we now have the ability to launch that and that's going to be amazing and we're actually getting ready to launch some new campuses here soon and they won't have kids ministry when they start but we'll grow into that as well so the last question Jimmy's asking about the, how the prayer gathering uh, kind of is organized. Is it, is it just an open thing that you just invite anyone who wants to come? Is there a core team that's part of it? Uh, just saying it sounds like it's a smaller, more intimate group. And so how, how is it gathered together? Yeah, so anybody can come to it, and we, we publicize it every week. Um, it's the smallest thing that we do, you know, kind of a typical week is about 100, a big week will be 150 to 200. Part of that's because of the time that we do it, and the other part of it is just kind of the nature of what it is still. So um, we have a small little leadership team that drives that, and that's headed up by one of our staff guys, one of our campus pastors, drives our prayer gathering. Um, but it's just open to anybody uh, to come and to, to pray and be prayed over and prayed with us. And, so, thank you. I've got one more question, Dave. I, I didn't prep you for this one, so uh, I, I hope you, you feel comfortable with it. You're uh, you're a young guy, have a young family, and leading a, a dynamic big church. How do you protect yourself uh, spiritually, emotionally, and physically? Yeah, that's thanks for asking that. Thanks for asking that question. You know, one of the big things has been trying to, de to really develop communal rhythms that I'm walking in and that I'm accountable to on a very deep level. And so, you know, it starts with my wife and I. And so um, I'm actually coming out of a, every summer I'll take four weeks where I, I don't preach anywhere um, at our church or anywhere else. And one of the main reasons is I want to make sure I don't become a guy who's just handing off what God is putting in me and so I'm kind of in one of these seasons right now just really evaluating okay God is my heart still good is it am I still in this am I still with you and good news is I am you know in this season uh, twice a year my wife and I try to get away on a spiritual retreat just she and I to, to hear from the Lord together and to so it really kind of starts in our home with Sydney and I and then really kind of building a team around us of now, we've worked very hard not to be, um, you know, Superman or to, to build a church that's built on us. I know this will sound kind of crazy. There are a lot of people at Ethos that couldn't even tell you my last name. And, and it's not because, you know, they don't like me or because uh, any of you that have been around Ethos, you just kind of this to be true. It's, it's just, it's not the Dave show. And, um, you know, we... We try to serve and, and to work and to lay it down, but we also try to take ourselves out of some of the pressure-inducing moments at times so we don't get crushed by the weight of it and start doing stupid things. And you know, So um, we just try to work really hard to, to stay in that rhythm, to have people really close to us that know us and love us and can you know, see when we're not being authentic and genuine and tell us to slow down. And you know, So this happened a few months ago. I was going pretty hard. And at the end of our morning gatherings, one of uh, 
one of my key leaders, one of my key staff guys came up and he said, hey, we made an executive decision. Um, tonight you're preaching via video. We're not letting you come back. And I'm such an extrovert. I hate that because I want to come back and be around everybody. And they're like, no, you can't come back. Go home. We, we made the choice and uh, it's a done deal. And, and so, you know, trying to submit and to walk in that and with brothers and sisters that love us really well um, is key. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're learning from a lot of, um, my parents really modeled this for me really well. Um, my dad and mom have been in full-time ministry 37 years and, and uh, they still love each other, love the church and love us. And, and so that's kind of been my model. It is like God making me more like my dad and this thing will be okay. So. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, thanks for spending the, the morning with us this morning. It's been just really informative and encouraging. And we'd like to leave you with a blessing. I've asked Jimmy Adcox to uh, go up and lay his hands on you via the computer and just pour his blessing out over you. Awesome. Thank you. I love you guys. Thank you for letting me be with you today. And uh, nice to meet those of you that I have not met before. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we are so grateful to you for your power and your greatness and what you are able to do to change lives and to breathe new life into dead bones. And Father, we thank you so much for the way your spirit has moved in the church at Ethos. We thank you for the openness that is there, for the willingness to trust and to risk and to step out, and for hearts filled with dependency on you that keep coming back to prayer again and again and again. And Father, we thank you for David and for Sydney and for their hearts and for their ministry and for the acknowledgement, Father, that it's not them, it's you. But we just pray, Father, that you will continue to uh, protect Dave and Sydney that you will surround them with your love and your presence and with people who love them and protect them even as they seek to shepherd and seek the welfare of, of those entrusted to them. And Father, we just pray that you'll keep them strong and vital in their relationship with you, uh, that the more success you bring, the more dependent they become. And the more acknowledging they are, Father, of who you are and what you're doing and that they're just instruments in your hands. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, the movement that is underway at Ethos and that is growing and spreading will continue. And we pray that it will just be a mighty movement that will spread out into other cities and other places where new people can come to know you. And we pray, Father, that that will energize uh, existing churches and give us hope and illustrations of your power so that we can trust in you again and we can tell stories, Father, that will uh, ignite all of our people to realize that uh, this journey uh, is available to us and that we pray that you'll lead us on journeys that are unique to us, the places you've placed us, the callings you've given us. Father, just maximize your work in each of the churches who are represented here today. And may we also, Father, uh, experience the, the goodness of what it means to walk with you and see your spirit at work among us. Father, we pray all of this to your glory and to your honor. And uh, we just pray for your continued blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, David. Amen. Amen. See you guys. Have a great rest of the time together.